very special experience. <coughs> right, so I'm going to talk about um, Per Martin Love's meaning explanations for intuitionistic type theory and uh, my own thoughts about how they connect with tests and games. So I have this feeling that this is something important to talk about here in, uh, during this uh, special year. So, you know, um, if you read something like the mailing list constructive in use and you see the discussions between various constructive mathematicians, it becomes quite clear that it's not so clear what it means with constructive mathematics. And there are many different opinions about that. So in February this year, I was in a meeting in uh, Lumini, attended among others by Jean-Yves Girard. So I asked him up front, are you a constructivist? And he said, oh, there are just chapels. There are just chapels. So that, that's of course very good news because it's kind of important, but do they know why? <laughs> so <that's laughs> uniform convergence, yes, it's a, it's a uniform convergence. So I think you know that what uh, somehow many explanations uh, uh, try to do is to somehow lay down something like what are the reasons for why constructive constructive uh, logic is as it is. So I'll just make a little bit of a survey picture, it's one of these kind of uh, histories of the 20th century written in retrospect, kind of uh, maybe not being uh, historically accurate, but looking at the history from, from present day perspective. So, um, uh, you know, it all started about a hundred years ago with Brouwer's ideas of, uh, you know, the meaning of the logical constants leading to his uh, denial of uh, excluded middle and double negation laws, uh, more explicitly by the, you know, the writings of Kolmogorov of, of um, a calc I mean, logic as a calculus of problems and Heiting as a calculus of intended constructions. Uh, you know, these were somehow informal discussion of what the meaning of, of the logical constants are. So the next step I want to mention then is the work by Kleene on the realizability model, which in a way one can look at as making mathematically precise what they discussed informally. So maybe people working on realizability be, being very familiar with the history may object that this is not perhaps historically accurate, but at least it was something about, about um, connecting uh, uh, intuitionistic logic with recursion theory. So, of course, I'm very happy if anyone interjects and objects during the talk, you know, and perhaps corrects historical and other inaccuracies. Okay, then we jump to the late 1960s <coughs> when, uh, you know, the, f the formulas as types idea was extended to predicate logic. The Curry, you know, the Curry correspondence for propositional logic was extended by Howard to to predicate logic and introducing thereby dependent types. And I think independently, <coughs> de Brown introduced dependent types as for his meta-language for, for um, uh, formalizing mathematics in the automath system. Also independently, which something happened which is very related, and that was Lovier's notion of categorical model for predicate logic called hyperdoctrine which in a way, if you look at it, is also a kind of formulas as types idea, you know, or really formulas as objects, proof as arrows idea. <coughs> and he gets some kind of formal system, which is 
you know, eerily close to, <laughs> close to Martin Dell type theory. Not quite, but almost. So all this was kind of pulled together in some kind of rather sketchy, but nevertheless very interesting paper by Dana Scott called Constructive Validity, which was also, I think it was published 1970, which is, you know, if you look at it with the eyes of posterity, it looks like a sketch of Martin Dell type theory. So one thing one might say about <laughs> these works, you know, is that, well, this special year is a full-scale attack on the problem of, of identity in type theory. It, this is a problem which hasn't gone away. And if you read these papers, you see that it started immediately. <laughs> Howard has several formulations of rules for identity types. Uh, De Brown, I'm, I, have, I haven't read this, I'm not quite sure about that, but certainly Lovier understands that one can have, you know, one can both define identity as the left adjoint of substitution along the diagonal, and he understands that in some cases, you know, one will have an extra rule saying that if such identity objects have elements, then the corresponding arrows should also be equal, which is, you know, the same uh, as the rule which leads to extensional type theory in, uh, in, in persons. Uh, Scott abandons his whole approach because he has a system which has an undecidable notion of equality, and he's discouraged by Kreisel and Gödel to stop this, you know, because it it's doesn't look promising. Yes? Yeah, okay, so... So also he is aware that we have a more sort of subtle spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of equalities than we are used to. Uh, okay, so these kind of preliminary pieces of work kind of gelled into what is, uh, you know, Martin Lev type theory, where the first, you know, there was this uh, I I type colon type version, 1971, and then was the first consistent version in 1972. There was a precise definition of intuitionistic type theory, precise, so that one could actually prove, you know, normalization properties in, in particular of, of this, uh, of this is system. And also the idea of universe was introduced, which is absolutely central to the, to the enterprise. Universe has a kind of background role in set theory, I think. They need, need it for things like category theory, but not, you know, in ordinary mathematics, perhaps. But here they are important straight away because in this theory they, they are the sole source of type dependency. In this theory there is no identity type, wisely. So of course you have to, you can define your own identity types, but there is no uniform general identity type. That came in 1973, which actually is not part of my history, but nevertheless there was a published version of, of this work, but which changed the theory and which introduced the identity type. Then there was the work by Peter Axel on <coughs> interpreting Martin Lev type theory in predicate logic, a first order theory of combinators, in order to establish the proof theoretic strength of this. So, you know, this is a realizability model in the spirit of Kleene. Although, of course, Kleene used number realizability. So, for example, you know, functions were interpreted as, as indices of Turing machines. Peter interpreted in a language of combinators, what's sometimes called abstract realizability. Peter told me this was a suggestion of Dana Scott. Um, <coughs> then the next item in my history is the 1979 paper by Per constructive mathematics and computer programming, which is, so as to speak, the paper where type theory reaches out to the world. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's got a very nice story, a compelling story about the, the identity, you know, of constructive mathematics and computer programming. A large part of the paper is also spent on the so-called meaning explanations, which was a novelty at that stage. And I'm going to say something more about meaning explanations. But as you can see, I have put them in bold face, <laughs> just as this, <laughs> because they are important, you know. Are they something for serious folks? Well, 
they are not as widely known as they should. This is absolutely my, my feeling. The theory also changed and Per added this rule, you know, the identity reflection rule that I used to like to call it, that was discussed already by, by Law Veer. Uh, <coughs> and um, because it was justified by the meaning explanations. So the first snapshot, the first approximation of what the meaning explanations are is that it's the same thing that Peter did, but with a philosophical touch on it. This is, you know, done in a first order theory. This is done without a theory at all. It's done in so, so as to speak, you know, primitive terms. Tries to explain from basic principles what the meaning of the constructs of type theory are, what the meaning of the judgments are. The last item on my, in my history is from 1986, when somehow history stopped. <laughs> Per changed his mind. He rejected the rules which lead to extensional type theory and went back to a theory which is actually quite similar to the 1972 theory, although it does keep the identity type. It's now formulated in a two-level structure. There is a so set type distinction, which we discussed quite a lot the other day in the informal type theory se seminar. So it's this, there is a, a basic logical framework of the analytic kind in Bob's, in, in Bob's talk. And then there is the type theory itself, which is, you know, uh, the, the theory that you implement as constants on, on top of this, uh, on top of this logical, logical framework. So, um, so we ended up with intentional type theory. I will more discuss the reasons for, for this, this step. I also want to say, you know, that what, what do we have in as basis for constructive mathematics? We don't only have past type theory. And what I know as the most sort of, you know, the alternative so-called predicative constructive mathematics. I'm not mentioning the impredicative field. So there is the myhill axel constructive set theory, and there are various type-free theories, both by Peters, like what he used in his uh, in his um, realizability paper, and the Pfefferman theories, you know, under the umbrella of so-called explicit mathematics. But with respect to meaning explanations, these are secondary with respect to Martin Lev type theory. This is very explicitly given constructive meaning by Peter by an interpretation of the constructive cumulative hierarchy in Martin Lev type theory. Per himself has been very interested in these type-free theories. There was actually a period between, I think we decided it was between 1982 and 1986, when Per considered these theories more basic than type theories. And he also wrote about the meaning theory from the point of view of them being more, more basic than, than type theory. Uh, this can be read in the so-called Siena lectures from 1983, I think. Yes, and as we all know, you know, Martin Lev type theory is the core of New Pearl, Koch, and Agda. Of course, Koch has impredicativity, but it also has inductive definition. So it is in some sense a kind of hybrid of Martin Lev type theory and the calculus of constructions. Yeah, we all know that. Oops, what is this? It will disappear, I hope. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, yeah, you just. Yeah, you know what's behind <laughs> it. Uh, you know, Martin Lev type theory simply appears by taking a predicate logic and apply the Curry Howard correspondence, you know, and the rules for, you know, that, that you get by kind of you certain strengthenings of the, of the ordinary predicate log logic rules, taking into account proof, uh, proof objects. Then, of course, you can also extend the idea to include other types, like natural numbers, the very versatile and uh, well orderings, which can be used for a lot of, of codings of stuff, as we saw the other day, and a sequence of universes. Then, later on, computer scientists, including myself, 
have thought about extending the language to make it more suitable for programming by introducing general notions of inductive definitions and you know even making excursions into the constructive higher infinites making bigger universes, super universes, universe hierarchic Malu universes, autonomous Malu universes is I think the largest which maybe is published. <laughs> there is and you know there is this notion of general inductive recursive definition and the reason why I want to mention this is that all of this you know can be explained with meaning explanations following exactly the same sort of patterns as the more basic theory that actually in devising these extensions it's absolutely essential to take a starting point from the meaning explanation. In some sense the meaning explanations almost suggest them by themselves. And the idea is of course that they should be good extensions in the sense that they fit the same I ideas about why they are constructively, constructively uh, valid as the more, the, the, the more um, you know, o the, the more original constructions. Okay, so what are Pearl's meaning explanations? Well, they are sometimes called direct semantics, intuitive semantics, standard semantics, or a very good word, syn the syntactico-semantical approach to meaning. They are pre-mathematical as opposed to meta-mathematical. I mean, we heard the other day Vladimir sort of saying, well, ultimately everything is ZF set theory. <laughs> and of course, the meaning explanations are sort of a kind of antidote to the feeling that we are living in can Cantor's paradise and not in the real world. That there is some th such possible discussion which can kind of be done without presuming that we have some kind of powerful mathematical framework to be, to rely on. You know, I think this is very related to finitistic ideas of, you know, what mathematics is about. I was even accused when I gave a similar talk in Stockholm a couple of months ago of being a finitist. <laughs> I don't agree with this, but... Yes, yes, exactly, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good comment. <laughs> okay, if you want to read firsthand about the <coughs> meaning explanations, you should read the paper Constructive Mathematics and Computer Programming, where they are given for the first time, wh where the, all, all the rules of type theory are listed, but without any motivations. There is just this famous quote, you know, in the end, everyone has to understand for himself. Whereas in the book, the meaning explanations are given and the rules are quite laboriously motivated according to the, you know, why they are correct with respect to the meaning explanations. There is a more recent and less well-known, I don't even know if it's published, series of lectures, Philosophical Implications of Type Theory, given in 1987. So after the 1986 shift from, from extensional to intentional type theory. And note that before 1979, there were no discussion of meaning explanations. There were some informal discussions about const constructivity, but otherwise a large part of the paper was taken up by normalization proofs. Of course, normalization proofs should be kept very clearly distinct from meaning explanations. Roughly speaking, normalization proof proves that you have normal form for all expressions and you normalize usually open expressions as well. Whereas meaning explanations is all connected to computation of closed expression. So I like to say this, you know, that meaning explanations is about the primary, the primary notion of primary school computation. Normalization is about the secondary school notion of normalization of open expression, the sec which is a secondary notion. Okay, so <coughs> the first thing you have to set up is an untyped computation system with a notion of, e of a computation of closed expression to canonical form. Functional programmers call this thing often weak head normal form. So I've just displayed the rules connected to natural numbers. So in type theory you can of course define types by recursion, for example you know, by elimination rules using universe and so on. So we have to have computation rules for types as well. So the natural numbers is itself canonical, so you don't, you know, it's, it's its own value. Zero is itself canonical, it's its own value. 
everything beginning with the successor sign is canonical, irrespectively of the argument. Now, it's the lazy natural numbers. And then we have a recursion combinator, which is, you know, specified like this, as you see, it's so-called big step, sem uh, big step uh, uh, semantics, as it's often called in computer science nowadays, or natural semantics. But I think, actually, this was the first place you know, in past constructive mathematics and computer programming, that at least I saw this, this kind of style of, the, of giving the operational semantics. Is there a reason to become easier than expected Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, but no, they are finite. I, if you want to go into those sort of things, you should. Um, uh, you know, this is what domain interpretation has to do I with this. Yeah, no, there is a definite answer to this question, and the answer is no. Okay, so now when we know what it means to compute something to canonical form, we can now explain the judgments, you know, and we can, so as to speak, define, you know, the judgments relating to natural numbers, saying that any type which computes to n surely is a good type. If two things compute to n, then they are surely the same types. If the type computes to n and little a computes to zero, then surely little a is, a, is a, an element of big A. And similarly with successor, where we have to check that the argument B is also a natural number. And similarly for equality, you know, that if, uh, yeah, if big A goes to N, little a and little a prime goes to zero, then surely they are equal natural numbers, and similarly for successors. You're thinking ahead of me. You, below, you are one of us, Bob. <laughs> Cornell is a kind of Swedish colony. How to understand these rules? Metamathematically, realizability, or pre-mathematically, meaning explanations. So, of course, if you understand these rules metamathematically, you would understand them as the rules, int introduction rules of an inductive definition of four simultaneous things, well, five maybe, you know, the predicate on expressions saying that something is a type, the binary predicate, the, the yeah, binary predicate, ternary predicate, and maybe we should introduce the context too in, in, gen in general, right? We could write this, this all down, you know, see it as, as an inductive definition. Unfortunately, it's not a positive inductive definition because the membership predicate will occur negatively in the rules for type dependency. So one has to do something a bit clever, which I think Peter did first with in his work on models of, uh, of, uh, of, of yeah, type theory based on uh, basically this, this idea. Uh, and there was also work by Stuart Allen a slightly in from Cornell at a slight a variation of that, which also gives, gives models of these. You know, see this as just introductory rules of an inductive definition. Show that it actually you know, has a fixed, uh, that, that they have a fixed point but they, they there is something least set closed under them. The general pattern, you know, is that to be a type means that you should compute to something beginning with a type former, a big C here, type constructor. To be equal types, you should begin with the same type former. To be an element of something, you should be an element constructor associated to a type constructor. And to be equal elements, you should be the same element constructor associated to that type constructor. Uh, and actually, so there are some dot, dot, dots here which says that that's not all there is to it. There has to be, you know, other requirements on the arguments. And of course, this will differ from different types. But already this is on the way to suggesting type theory as a general theory of inductive definitions. So for the case of the universe, I will actually here be a little bit old-fashioned and use universe a la Russell, because universe a la Russell make perfect sense in the meaning explanations. They were there in the 1979 paper, you know. It's all easy with what's the type, what are equal types. You know, the elements of universes are small types. If, you know, I mean, say big A is e 
is u, symbol for universe, little a computes to pi x b c, and if b is a universe and c is a family of universes indexed by elements of b, then little a is in, in big A. Easy pieces. A small remark, which I'm not going to go into detail, is actually that pair does not require this will not, I mean, the fact that, that I had on the previous picture, actually, that equal types should begin with e equal type constructors. It's not, this is actually not how Per explains type equality. He instead t takes a more extensional viewpoint that two types are equal if they have the same elements and the same notion of equality. This is a variation, but with what I'm going to talk about, you know, it will be more systematic, uh, it will actually be necessary to have this interpretation where, where we force them to be, to be equal. Then comes the meaning of hypothetical judgment. Can you guess? It means that, you know, if you have a little a in big A, where both little a and big A depends on some variables, x1 to xn of types a1 to a, and what does it mean? Well, it means, you know, this is verbatim out of uh, constructive mathematics computer programming, except that I changed the notation slightly and incompletely. <laughs> um, if you substitute closed terms of appropriate types for the variables, both in the term and in the type, then this should be a valid categorical judgment. And s moreover, you know, this should also be happen if you substitute equals for equals, then the results should be equal. However, here I want to say something before I show you this picture. So there was once, you know, I hope Per will forgive me to say <laughs> saying this, when Per gave a talk about, me partly about meaning explanations in the summer school in Gien in 2002, he started by saying something like, when some people hear me talk about my meaning explanations, they feel I have said nothing. And this is how it should be. <laughs> the standard semantics should be just that, standard. It should come as no surprise. So Pell may, of course, object, you know. <laughs> but this is, you know, I, th I think this is very important. This is very important. However, although a lot of things are very expected, not everything is so absolutely, you know, there is a lot to discuss. For example, the identity type. This is verbatim out of uh, the book, Intuitionistic Type Theory. We now have to explain how to form canonical elements of the identity type i, big A, little b, a, little b. The standard way to know that this is true is that it's true as a judgment, little a is equal to little b in big A. And this was, of course, explained before. Thus, the introduction rule is simply, if little a is equal to little b in big A, then there is a canonical proof called R for reflexivity of that, yeah, little a is equal to little b in, in big A. Here, R does not depend on little a, little b, or big A. It does not matter what canonical element there is, this type has, when provided little a and little b are equal in big A, as long as there is one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Indeed. Yes, exactly. So it's, I mean, the way to think about it is that, yeah. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. So it's, you get a very good picture of it by actually doing the mathematical model construction. But then you have to take a step back and sort of say that 
well, actually, computation is something that I can understand without understanding mathematics. And we can understand how we recognize various expressions being connected to each other. So for example, that the symbol zero is connected to the type symbol n because zero is supposed to be an element of n. Those are sort of more elementary considerations than, than you know, whether a certain inductive definition has a closure ordinal, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, realizability and logical relations are very closely connected. Okay, so then Per goes on to validate these rules. You know, if we have a proof in the identity type, then the corresponding uh, judgment is valid. And, as you said very clearly on the previous page, there is only one. It has to be equal to R. It's contractible. So the mini explanations, they lead to extensional intuitionistic type theory. You can prove that function exta extensionality follows from this rule. Unfortunately, we have non-normalizing terms. Although we should remember that we have Although we have general norm non-normalizing you know, terms in the language, we, which is full normalization, including uh, open expressions, we have the fact that it was built into, into the meaning explanations that if little a is in big A, then both little a and big A must have a canonical form for closed, if they are closed terms. But the non-normalization leads to undecidable judgments. For example, even if we know that big A is a type, and of course this is also undecidable, then we, don't, then we cannot decide whether a certain element, little a, is a member of that big A, which is the case in the intentional theory. So in 1986, Peart changed his mind and he, he rejected these rules. But they remained valid at Cornell. <laughs> I think they ceased to be true in all of Europe, but in America, mm -hmm. <laughs> they were still made good use of. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> it was before the time of, you know, <laughs> internet. <laughs> okay, so we have extensional meaning explanations for intentional type theory. Too bad. Okay, so what I think is the majority attitude is that the meaning explanations provide necessary but not sufficient criteria for validity of judgments. The judgment should also be decidable. But here I want to emphasize that decidability is a global condition. It means that we have an algorithm for the whole theory which decides this question, whereas we would perhaps like you know, in the meaning explanation, it's something very local. It only has to do with the computations of the constituent components of a single judgment. A minority opinion, which is mine, <laughs> is that the judgments of extensional type theory are all valid, but we may sometimes prefer intentional type theory for pragmatic reasons. However, we should be very aware of the fact that you know, what, I'm a, what does one say in English? Swings and roundabouts. <laughs> there are pros and cons. And in certain situations, it's a real pain to work in intentional type theory. And my experience that when you try to do these kinds of internal model constructions and so on, it becomes completely unbearable. But Thierry is doing very good work in <laughs> actually living with intentional type theory here at the Institute of Advanced Study. Yeah? So the question there behind Yes? Yeah. Um, the master has not quite understand the computation of meaning or explanation. Yes. In an interview way, the meaning or explanation is the first two constructions and the first two slides. Yes. For all Richmond rules and specific formulation and co-formulation of functions. Yes. And then as soon as you go to the meaning or explanation for the identity type, you're given another paragraph of prose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I, it's, <laughs> it's a deficiency of my talk, but the reason is that I actually wanted to quote verbatim. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think 
think uh, it's just a question of writing down, you know. I mean, it, it would be, it would simply be, you know, if Yeah, so let's, sorry, I should say, it should be like this. But otherwise, it is just, yeah, it should, no, it should, it should also be like this. Uh, C, uh, big A goes to I, A, A, B. This would be the systematic way of doing it as the in the same way as, as the others, yes. Yes, uh, th th that's uh, but that's yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Sorry. So w let's let's take this. So you say yes. Yeah, so you would have another rule saying this. You know, you would have this again. Uh, C goes to R. C prime. Sorry. C goes to R prime. And then you have C equals C prime. Uh, sorry, yeah, it would, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, here, yes. R. Uh, no, so yeah, so we have a, you know, I want to write the judgment in such a way that it's, for reasons that will be become apparent later, I want to write them this way so that it's completely undetermined what type we take here. You know, this, depending on the presentation, is not always the case. Maybe it would sometimes be already be normalized down here. But I want to write it like this, saying that C, one way of getting that C is equal to C prime is in big A. It's by computing A. Ah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so I don't want to use C. B, B. Big B is better. I don't like big C. I don't. Yeah, and uh, here too, you know, and this is this is copied down there, right? As is the definition of equality. As is the definition of equality. Yeah. Yes, exactly, because this is the only way. Well, it. Um, yeah, maybe we should, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting point, actually, because it, um, uh, I don't think I have ever checked that, actually. Um, right. So there are these two possible attitudes, you know, that it's a pragmatic, way. intentional type theory may serve a pragmatic role, but the ultimate truth is the extensional type theory. <coughs> and then there is Pass's recent idea of changing the meaning explanation so that they more precisely capture the notion of validity that you have in intentional type theory, so that the meaning explanations reject the rules of extensional type theory for the identity type. So now I'm finished with the introduction to meaning explanations, and I'm going to go to my own path to believing in this. So uh, I'm sorry for those of you who have heard re related talk because I very much like to quote Donald Knuth, you know, famous quote, you know, beware of bugs in the above code. I have only proved it correct, not tried it, you know. A memento for everyone in, in, in program verification. How true isn't it, you know. I think they proved a computer correct in Cambridge in the early 80s, you know. And the computer was wrong anyway. It's very bad publicity. Okay, what about this then? Beware of bugs in the above proof. I have only followed inference rules, not run it. This is not the way we usually think about it, but Martin Lev type theory gives us this possibility. This possibility was exploited by the Japanese logician and constructor of proof assistant, Susumu Hayashi. He called it proof animation. So he said that when he did proofs in PX, he often used the techniques that he ran the proofs and checked whether, the <laughs> whether they were correct by testing. 
and before he tried to prove it. And he said, this methodology was so good that I kept quiet about it because what I really wanted to do was to, to promote uh, program verification. But he has also, you know, so this was to begin with a practical enterprise, but he has a foundational enterprise where he is, uh, you know, looking at the meaning of, of classical logic, actually, from the point of view of proof animation. So this is where the buck stops. The way I sort of came to kind of be convinced about these things is that, yeah, of course, this is, this is, what we're, this is how we should think about it. This is really what, this is really what PAL means, you know. Uh, this gives some kind of ultimate notion of validity. The fact that testing is more basic than proving is actually the ultimate thing. So if we look at it in this way, then judgments can be refuted or corroborated by running tests. So mathematics becomes just like, you know, one of the sciences where we can, you know, run tests. We can usually never, you know, completely validate some kind of natural law, but we can, you know, test it and believe it more, more or less. This gives us a, a local notion of validity of a judgment. It should not refer to the formal system of which is a part. And I think this is maybe my main objection to the decidability criterion. It is that it is not a local criterion. So if we look at the meaning explanations once again, and we just write them in slightly different words rather than these kind of uh, inference rule style, but we just write them as a sort of testing manual, you know. Some hapless user is going to test our system and run the expressions, you know, and then the hapless user will say, okay, so I'm going to test whether little a is in big A and runs big A. It becomes N, and if little a becomes zero, the, the hapless user is very happy. And so on, you know, if, if he gets the wrong constructor, he's very unhappy. And of course, we can, we can test the universe in the, in the same way. X, X colon B. Pr yeah, so I will come to that. Okay. You're a quick mind. Cornell guy. <laughs> Cornell descendant. Okay, so to test hypothetical judgments, you know, depending on x1 to a variables x1 to xn, we need to generate arbitrary elements, little a to little n, and test the categorical judgment that we get from substituting the, you know, these elements. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, it's no problem if the type is the natural numbers, because maybe we shouldn't try to generate an arbitrary element computing to a natural number, but we generate the canonical ones, you know, the canonical ones where also the, the body is canonical. The zero, one, two, three, four. It's, this seems fine, no problem. Similarly, if we want to uh, generate elements of an identity type of natural numbers for closed, you know, categorical judgment of identity type, we simply compute M and N and see if they are the same. This we can do. And then we generate the reflexivity proof. But it's more difficult if we want to generate an arbitrary function. We could, of course, try to say that, well, we will somehow gen enumerate all the, all the things which um, in Martin Love type theory have the type n arrow n. But first of all, we want to define, <laughs> you know, we want to justify this would be sort of circular. It's we, we don't know yet what is suppo supposed to be an element of, of, of this. We don't want to take the system for granted. Yeah? Are you, are, you, are you trying to generate all elements? You know, what are you doing? I want to try to generate all elements, yes. For In a certain purpose? sense. For, for what purpose do you need all of them? Um, well, if it's not all of them, then uh, at least in principle, we should be able to ge generate all of them so that we really ex exhaust any possibility, you know, that, uh, you know, I mean, this is what Per said, you know, it should be an arbitrary element. But of course, what I'm discussing here is what th this notion of arbitrary really means. Because there might be other methods of, 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think this is an, uh, a, a very interesting objection, and we maybe sh can discuss that more after after the talk. Uh, yeah, I have a question. When you when you set a function, mm -hmm. do you do it as a term or as a black box that you store somewhere? I think I think of it as a black box. I I have it maybe, but I put it in a black box so I can't ex inspect it. I just it, you, I can just interact with it. This is very very interesting discussion, but I think we'll let's let's push on. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so we have a problem with generating arbitrary functions. We also have a problem of generating proofs of identities of functions, because <laughs> it would take infinitely long time. And we are trying to be finitistic here. You know, we're trying to do this within reasonable time. So basically, we don't, we cannot do that. So this is connected to the fact that it has been said that higher order functions are actually inherently impredicative, because you know, <laughs> what does it mean to you know, if we, if you think well, this is the point from of terms in some kind of formal system then maybe those terms will involve the functional itself. You know, so it's a ki there's kind of circularity going on. And that's, of course, very related to what I said before, why we, why we cannot in, uh, generate an arbitrary ter uh, term here. But the way out that I'm proposing is to make use of continuity. This argument will on only call finitely many arguments. And hence, the way we may go about it is to you know, use one of the big theories of continuity, domain theory. What we mean by all elements, you know, is in certain sense that we use the finite approximations and try to compute with them. So we tried to do this, but it wasn't easy. And it also led us rather more into something which is more operational than domain theory. What we really want to do is some have some kind of concrete procedure for generating arbitrary function inputs. So we were instead uh, led into game semantics. So you know, my collaborator Pierre Clarambo is uh, well, don't say yeah, is uh, you know he's a he's a game semanticist. So the idea would instead to be to lazily generate opponent strategies. So for example, Pierre is a lot working with Highland and Ong's games. So this is one one approach we have uh, we have tried, and and. Um, yeah, so this is qu quite a feasible approach, although it doesn't seem to be the, on the, only, the only way, way to, go, to go about things. Yes? Yeah, so if you want to set a function of type A or B, yeah. why couldn't you uh, like take a partial given segment um, um, from structure of type A and see if there comes, if the set eventually comes out? Like that is point B on the side. Yes, it's okay. similar to that, yes. Yes, okay. Bob? It's if you really think about it from the point of view of establishing semantically what is the meaning of a higher order function without reference to the formal system, which we later on want to, to justify, then we don't know the notion of elementhood. And therefore, you know, we have to do something which is independent of the notion of elementhood that we want to actually define to avoid circular reasoning. Yeah. 
yes, but you would still have something like, uh, uh, you know, the, the semantics of the function type yeah. would be that, you know, the input would, would be of the input type and then the output would be of so the output type. Right, but the, the problem with this, if you look at it from the point of view as a recipe of generating inputs, concrete generation of inputs, you cannot do it in general if the input type is something like a function type. Right, you cannot enumerate the... So we can't effectively. Yeah. I mean, what, are you, what you are doing in, in um, uh, New Pearl is very much kind of uh, following the meaning explanations. <laughs> uh, you're putting the meaning explanations to practical use in actually rather flex flexible and useful way, I would say. There is nothing wrong with it, but if you take this point of view that what we are really, really want to do from the point of view of foundations or from the point of view of practice, perhaps, we cannot, we cannot, this doesn't actually give us a practical testing recipe. You may be happy to see this as the meaning, you know, this is, I think is maybe something a bit subjective, but I would say that it's some kind of strengthening of the idea of meaning explanation, that you should not only just say that we take an arbitrary term, provided it in some kind of sense in which we cannot determine is of the right type, yeah. then we can instantiate it, but we should somehow be do it effectively, you know, and, and uh, yeah. I was confused about this. Why can't you determine whether the terms are the right type? Because, first, I mean, most fundamentally, because we are, what we are setting up is the definition of that notion. It's not yet, it's not just pinned down. That's the mo most fundamental reason, right? It's not yet pinned down. Um, we want, we have, we have a, f you know, <laughs> we define what it means to be elementhood, say. After we have defined elementhood, we will justify the formal system of, say, extensional type theory. Then, you know, uh, we can follow that formal system. But until, you know, until we have defined it, we cannot, we cannot use that. So we have to somehow, um, yeah, define this, use the semantic notion in order to, uh, to uh, generate, yeah? So I think I had actually, um, I think uh, Gordon Plotkin, when he listened to this, he had a very similar, uh, similar uh, objection. And of course, what we are somehow defining when with this notion of testing is the sort of things we can see in finite time. The ultimate notion has to be some kind of prediction about what goes on in, in infinity. And that, you know, when we go, we, we will not get away from the logical complexity inherent in that construction. That we will not get away from, but we will base it on this very concrete testing procedure. We cannot somehow, um, yeah, I th yeah, I, th I think that's what I would like to say as an answer to the question. Yeah. You were talking about focal points. Yes, but of course it's uh, it's uh, you know we can also see it as a testing procedure for partial functions, and what we the, the difference between testing partial and total functions is something about what, what we expect to happen in, in the infinity, so as to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, so you give us good uh, input and we try uh, and test for why it should not be triable, but in practice <coughs> it's identifiable, so it's probably less identifiable. So. It's the culprit for making it undecidable, yes, and that's why we need a new look at, well, you know, so that's where the, the, you know, the controversy is. Should it be there or should it not be there, these, these particular rules? Yeah, so the way I look at this, you know, is that it's, 
it's a refinement of past meaning explanations where input generation plays a dual role to output computation. And technically, it sort of co corresponds to moving from something like the realizability semantics to maybe some kind of game semantics or something inspired by game semantics. I, I perfectly agree with this with this this comment that this this is what's going on. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. So since we had these problems with generating, yeah. So the problem of generating elements of function types will be addressed by going towards uh, a game semantics. The problem relating to the identity of, uh, function, uh, of functions will instead be solved by defining the identity type by recursion on, on uh, the type structure. It's somehow, from this point of view, it's not enough just to generate a single reflexivity witness for an arbitrary identity respectively of the identity type it is from. So what we instead do is what you would have to do when you work in the identity-less theory in 1972 you define you know, a recursive function that computes the result of you know, whether m and n are, are, are equal, and then you, you transfer that to a proposition. So that would be the definition of equality of identity on, on n. And you define the identity of two functions by you know, the, pi, the, the, the pi sentence in, in question. Then you will get different kinds of witnesses. Here you will get you know, lambda, lambda yeah, function expressions. Here you will get, you know, actually here there will only be a single single ele ele element, but for that case, this is this is fine. And then, you know, we can define the reflexivity proof by induction on the on the structure on the structure of the of the of the type. And then we can justify the rules of that we have in extensional type theories. It's very clear very clear in the case of natural numbers that, you know, this will be the case if and only if the test of the identity judgment will, will, um, uh, will pass. And the test of this sentence here will pass if and only if the test of the, of the judgmental equality will, will pass. Uh, yes, I, let's see, where did I? Maybe I put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, right, right. It, yeah, thank you. Sorry, which? It's correct. Okay. Okay. Now to the universe. Since we define by induction on the structure of the types, we can try different ideas here. The uniform choice with respect to the meaning explanations would be to define some notion of extensional equality of codes. So we should really generate new codes, one code saying that n is equal to n as a you know, code for, the, for that identity type. For the, I mean, pi, pi x a and b is identical to pi x a prime b prime, provided we already have a witness that a is equal to a prime. We really look at the codes, you know, as kind of trees, well, you know, uh, well-ordered trees, possibly infinitely branching, sort of similar to the W type. So uh, the natural notion of extensional identity on, you know, the universe looked at, looked at something which is much like the W type would, would be defined in, in this way. And this would be, you know, this would just kind of check this extensional identity, and then we could also argue, you know, that, that we can validate identity elimination and identity equality for extensional type theory for you because this will correspond to the testing, uh, you know, sort of internalizing the testing procedures as, as, as lambda terms. Okay, what if we define, if we choose to define this as, uni uh, this as uh, isomorphism, then of course trivially we validate the univalence axiom, but of course we do not validate the identity elimination rules. So we are not in a position that somehow helps connect univalence to, um, to uh, meaning explanations. Um, the, well then the problem here is to express in the meaning explanations the idea 
that everything that you can construct preserves isomorphism. And this doesn't seem to me as something which is na natural, maybe even not even possible to sort of reconcile with the other ideas of the meaning explanations. But, you know, I'm willing to be proved wrong about, about that. But that's, that's at least the, fe the feeling I, I have. Yeah? Yes. Yes, exactly, and that's so it. So we left it open. Right. But we could very well have done that. Ah, yeah, so if you don't have universal elimination, <laughs> if you don't have universal elimination, yeah, then... we left it open. Yeah, yeah. So um, somehow a main purpose of this talk is to somehow <laughs> connect thoughts about meaning explanations to thoughts about univalence, you know, and this is, you know, <laughs> this is food for thought, food for thought, you know, and, and you, in Cornell you've already thought about these, the, the, these things, it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting. So another possibility to actually explicitly refer to Bob and Dan's paper where I actually found this quotation. So another way we could look at the connection between univalence and meaning explanation is that we build a group, groupoid model of intentional type theory which would then satisfy univalence for, in the limited sense of the first universe. Um, on the basis of extensional type theory, we carry out the model construction in extensional type theory. That would be one satisfactory answer of reducing univalence for one universe to extensional type theory if you belong to those who think that extensional type theory is satisfactory. And this thought, yeah? Yeah, that's the that's the idea, it's right? Very it's a very limited thing. So it's just it's just the first step in a possible, you know, more advanced uh, sequence of thoughts. So they, as they say, you know, so they are actually doing something in this paper which is very related to this idea. They define this two two dimensional type theory. And they say that an alternative to our current work would be to parallel this approach and define a groupoid interpretation into extensional type theory and thereby inherit equality from the meta language. And then they argue, you know, that they prefer to do what they are doing. The benefit of the approach we take here is that it provides a more direct description of the equational theory, presenting it directly in terms of the source language. But certainly they have thought, thought about this, which is very kind of consistent with the ideas that I have already presented. So next step in my talk is now to explain the connection between Highland on games and testing in the sense that I have been suggesting before. And I do that for a very simple system just so that it will be possible to draw the pictures. <laughs> but the idea is then that this thought generalizes. So the finite system T, you know, is the simply type lambda calculus with a, a base type of Booleans. So we have the ordinary lambda expressions, constant for true, constant for false, and we have conditionals. And then there is a result in game semantics that, you know, the, the thing which you use to model the lambda terms are called innocent, well-bracketed strategies. And I'm, I won't go into exactly what that is, but that is something which, 
corresponds exactly to functional computation. It's a way of forbidding both influences of control and state into the, into the, the strategies of the, of, the, of the language. But these strategies, they have a very nice correspondence with, you know, if, if you take the language of PCF, with certain kind of berm trees, which Pierre-Louis Curien called PCF berm trees. So they are not exactly the, the, the mo most uh, immediate berm trees you think about for this language, but they have the following structure, you know, a sequence of lambdas followed by the constructors true or false, or a conditional which gets stuck because there is a he head variable that you can't normalize further. And it's a sort of a, a head notion of normal form because you don't require the arguments of the x or the branches of the conditional to be normal. What if lambda x? One dot x one. Head yeah, so that expands to if x one true false. They, those two terms, they receive the same. They, they correspond to the same innocent strategy. It seems to kind of artificial, but that's how, ga how game semantics is is, uh, is set up. Yeah, so a head normal form is kind of one, you know, one step in the unfolding of one of these PCF berm trees. So now we should think about this in terms of testing. So first let's look at the simple example of testing whether something is a Boolean. Well, we compute a true, fine, compute a false, fine. It could be, you know, um, something beginning with a lambda, then the test, then the test fails. Here I should mean, you know, the innocent, no the, the head innocent normal form relation. So we draw this as an arena in the sense of Highland Ong games, you know, something where you can play the first move you can think about the op as the opponent asking what is, the, what is the innocent normal form of little a, and the player saying, well, it's either true or it's false. So these moves correspond to successful tests. Next example, test whether A is in bool arrow bool. So we apply A to an arbitrary variable X and we compute it. Maybe we are happy, we get directly to true and we are, we, you know, it's a Boolean, false, it's a Boolean. Or it's, you know, an innocent normal form beginning, you know, it uh, shouldn't begin with any lambdas because it should be a Boolean type possibly. And then, you know, so the form if X, B, C. Then the computation is stuck, and we need to generate the head variable, either to true, and then we test, in that case, you know, we want to test the first uh, branch, remembering that x is true, or we want to generate the second branch, uh, uh, compute the second branch, remembering that x is false. Yeah? Now this means, yeah, so now this means innocent normal form. So I mean, unfortunately, the meaning of arrow changes during the talk. I'm sorry about this. But uh, yeah, it's, it is because the notion of computation to canonical form, which pair has, does not coincide with the one we, we have for game semantics. And this is in some sense, you know, part of the sort of thing which, uh, you know, we have to decide, should we be close to pair or should we be close to, to game semantics? So the arena looks like this in, the, in this case, you know, that it's, uh, you think of this as a kind of, you know, the function arrow in, of arenas, it takes, you know, an arena for the result type and an arena for the input type and makes a move from that route to that route. <coughs> and, and put them to together like that. And intuitively, you know, or computationally, testing-wise, you can see it as, what is the answer, what is the result of AX? Well, it's either true or false, or it's something which gets stuck because we don't know what X is. And, you know, this is something which, the, here the player computes. And then, you know, when we get stuck at X, it's the opponent's turn to say, what is x? And it's either true or false. And then we 
we um, continue computing B, and you know we start again, and we 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 uh, we uh, uh, yeah we we backtrack so as to speak and continue until we have reached the result. So this is not the game tree. This is the arena. In Highland on games, there is a distinction between the arena where you can backtrack. You can unfold this kind of to a, a game tree in the usual sense where there would be subsidiary things going on. Yeah, so correspondence with game semantics. Move in arbitrary innocent well bracket opponent strategy. Only head occurrence of X is instantiated at the first stage. Repetition of moves is possible. This is sort of computations as associated to game semantics. This is, of course, different from computation in the sense of pair. And this is, you know, what we have to decide whether we should go in one direction or the other, or possibly, you know, do both. Yeah, so this picture is the same as last picture. I have just been a little bit inspired by Agda, and I have replaced the variables by meta variables. Because in general, the kind of things we need to generate may bind variables, just like meta variables in Agda. So it's perhaps a better picture, but otherwise it's the same, so I won't spend any time on it. You know. This means sort of you know, instantiating is like filling a hole in Agda. Test of functional. Well, again, you know, we can be lucky and we can compute the output directly. Or we get stuck because we have a head variable that we don't know. Uh, <coughs> yeah, or we can get the wrong constructor and fail. So this corresponds to the following arena where, you know, here we are successful. Here we get stuck at the head variable. And then, you know, it's the opponent's time to instantiate that head variable. And this is something of function type, so it should be either lambda y true or lambda y false. You know, insert it here and go on with the computation, in which case, you know, in the case of true, we should go on with C, and in the case of false, we should go on with D. Or, and here is what somehow game semantics differs from usual extensional type of thinking. The opponent could also instantiate a a strategy which itself is corresponds to one of these things which gets stuck with at, at the head variable. So you know lambda y if y, and we only want to instantiate one step, so we should leave holes for the branches which the, the opponent will instantiate later. And now you know when when this is inserted in this expression here, we will need to compute b. And that's the job of the player, and this will be true and false, and depending on the result, you know, we will, we will go on with, uh, with uh, the, the computation. Why are these only In uh, the limited case of, sis of, of system T, all, all head normal forms either have the shape true, false, or if. And of course, that can be preceded by lambdas, but then we are, going, then we are wrong since... Uh, since uh, Yes, I'm only going to test the... the yeah. The yes, that satisfies my curiosity. That's the assumption. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe. I, 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 yeah, I agree. It's, uh, this, yeah, it's a good comment. Sorry? This one, yes. I mean, this is, you know, the head normal form. I mean, one, one possible, what I call, innocent head normal form. I mean, innocent head normal forms, which begin win, with one variable, either has this shape, that shape, or that shape. That's the, the only possibilities. The things you plug in are otherwise closed. Uh, yeah, they're close, but they can de they're close, but they can depend on new on new meta variables. I mean, in this yeah. case here, in this case here, you know, in general, you know, the thing we plug in can have a, can have free variables in the, in them, right? Because we 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 do 
Yeah, because meta variables can depend on context, right? This is just, yeah. So this is just a picture of how complicated it is to play, you know, twice the twice functional applied to true versus not. So I, I won't go through this tree, but it is, you know, about how, so here I haven't actually expanded it, them to the innocent normal form, but you know how, well, we ask the question, what's the result? We do that by computing the head normal form, identifying the head variable. The opponent is asked to uh, what is the result. Before it can know that, it has to know what is the argument. Here it computes the argument. Then, you know, it, we, we ask, it, this can't be computed, so it has to be instantiated, needs to know its argument is computed, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, I'm not going to say very much about system T, but it's just to show the arena for lazy natural numbers. You know, you ask what is the result, if it's zero, or if it's successor of B, then you need to know the result of B, and this is an opponent question, which will ask that, and so on. Few minutes just saying rather briefly the status of the, what we do for for type theory. So this is just, you know, the syntax of fragment of type theory that we work with, you know, with booleans, natural numbers, sigma types, pi types, and the universe, and eliminators, and interestingly, including the universe, elim universe eliminator. So we're uh, testing judgment as game playing. We, you know, here we are actually staying closer to pair and do computation to weak head normal form again as player moves, instantiation of variables as opponents moves, and matching constructors of terms with constructor types, checking whether the rules of the game are satisfied. And one can look at the situation as some kind of arena of untyped expressions, where you both, you know, you either compute something to a type or to an element, and then we will have these innocent, well, were these things where we get stuck, in this case, at the, at the variable. Uh, and the sort of why this changes the scenery from the usual, from the usual uh, game semantics is that the arena is not def defined, determined by the type, you know, before the game, but the, the correct arena is determined by moves for the types. The types, you know, if you have a, if you compute a type, then we will know that to compute the term to a, a, a certain element will be, will be correct. So it will sort of cut down the, 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 no, the, correct, the correct moves we have. So technically, just say a few words about that, you know. To test the judgment, we work with pairs of judgments and environments where we keep track of instantiations. We have to instantiate the holes, you know, lazily only, only uh, instantiating head variables and then remembering the other, you know, how, how uh, the, the instantiations were, were before. So Pierre likes to call these uh, meta variables channels. I think this is some tradition in game semantics. And the channel environment, you know, it keeps track of the types of channels and also the terms which have, they have been instantiated to. So a channel has a type and a context. And the term we use for one level of instantiation of a channel is atomic normal form. It sort of corresponds to this kind of skeleton of a, of a you know, a, a, a head normal form in the sense we are using the word. So if it's a categorical judgment, you know, then we start with an empty channel environment. If it's a hypothetical judgment, the first thing we do is to replace every ordinary variable by a channel because we are going to instantiate the, the channels, the meta variables. Then we will do a transition system which will, you know, capture the testing process. We will move from one, st one step to, uh, to another. And the final states of this, of this um, uh, transition systems are, you know, the axioms of the you know, the, well, the introduction rules without premises. If we, are, if we have come to a situation where, where we have got true 
in the element side and bool on the type side, then we are fine. We have this, the, the test has, has finished happily. And similarly, false, zero, canonic, I mean, booleans and natural numbers in the universe are also final states. Then the introduction rules with premises, which corresponds to transitions, you know. Uh, so if we want to test successor of A in N, we test A in N. If A, B in sigma A, B, then we either test little a, we choose somehow non-deterministically either to test little a or to test little b. To test the function, we, you know, lambda x b, we test b with the variable instantiated to a channel and, you know, of the appropriate type by applying the type. I have a notion here where b is, you know, uh, kind of a, a lambda abstract, you know, so we apply that to the, to the seal. So it's, still a non thing, it's a non-deterministic thing. And the, the non-deterministic nature uh, captures the non-deterministic testing uh, nature of the testing that the opponent will choose non-deterministically which instantiation he will do this time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So in this case here, we we extend the channel environment with a new channel of the right type. That's a meta variable, yes, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not terribly comfortable with name channel either, but it's, it's what, um, what Pierre thinks is appropriate. So these were the somehow the stages where we match, I mean, on the previous pages, we had the stages where we match term constructor with type constructors. Then there is the situation when we have not yet computed the type or the term. And to do that here, we introduce a notion of generative evaluation, which means that we compute a term to a canonical form. But during this process, we may get stuck with you know, unknown head meta variables. And then we need to extend the environments with new instantiations. But if we want to test little a in big A in the environment tau 1, well, we try to compute big A in tau 1, and we will make a number of computations and instantiations. And finally, we will reach you know, a good type constructor, or some canonical form here, V, in an extended environment. And then we go on and test the term in that extended environment and get a canonical, hopefully, term constructor in, sorry, it will be t t tau 3 there, yes. In that case, you know, we, we reduce the testing of little a in big A in tau 1 to the testing of the canonical value V in big V with respect to the last, last environment. And we use some rule from the previous page. Yeah, so V is a canonical term form, outermost form is term constructor, and double uh, big V is a canonical type form, or outermost form is type constructor. So then what we need to define is the notion of generative evaluation. The presence of this tau here indicates that we part of the process is by ins instantiation. So, of course, if we, without doing any new instantiations, we can compute a canonical form already, then we can also compute it as a generative evaluation denoted with this longer arrow between pairs. However, we in the situation where we are stuck with a head context. So here is a grammar for the notion of head context that we have, you know, in this case, it's not exactly the innocent normal form, but something more related to pair semantics. Uh, it's variable, variable applied to term, if getting stuck in a head context, natrec, getting stuck in a head context, urec, getting stuck in a head context. Then we have two situations, either the variable at which we get stuck is already instantiated, in which case we have to compute that instance by a generative evaluation. Or we are in a situation where it has not yet been, been instantiated, and there is some kind of other typo here, I think. Yeah, it should be. Uh, C 
colon. I mean, C should be instantiated to a new instantiator of C instantiated to little a prime. So the situation is otherwise the, the same, but in this case, we need to compute the canonical form of the type of the channel before we know what is the correct instantiation of it. And then this is just an, a description of these atomic normal forms, the one step of the head normal form that we are using. So uh, I won't go through them, but maybe just say that, yeah, you know, for example, zero is one of these atomic normal forms, and sec successor with a channel variable here, you know, is an atomic normal form of the natural number, and then systematically for the other time, type formers. And then we have the situation where we also would like to generate things which get stuck at a head variable. And for this, we introduce an auxiliary, auxiliary notion which records the type of the variable at which we want to get stuck. Because we, can't, we don't know what that is, you know, what is the shape of a correct expression getting stuck at xi until we have computed the big AI. This is somehow the technical difficulty we have in type theory where we have to compute the types of the variable before we know how they can be, they can be instantiated. This is somehow what accounts for some of the complexity of this, of this enterprise. But once we have that, you know, so in this situation, for example, then we have one of these auxiliary expressions where, where, yes, I'm getting close to the issue, but I'm also getting close to the, yeah, anyway, I'm just, this just says that this is really an instruction to compute the type of A here. If it is a bool, we know that we can, we can instantiate that to if little a c c d, where this is maybe a variable, but it, it may also be some other neutral terms. So I think you know these are maybe technical details which I should skip at this stage of the talk and just summarize. So the idea here, you know, which we can dispute and debate afterwards and during lunch. <laughs> the test manual determines the meaning of judgments, including equality judgments. With this view, tests can corroborate or refute judgments as in philosophy of science. Tests with functional input leads us to games. Input generation corresponds to playing opponent strategy. And if we compare this with Pell's original meaning explanations, we get an alternative interpretation of hypothetical judgment, type equality, and identity types. But otherwise, of course, it's, it's the same. And in some sense, it's still the same, perhaps, but with a more refined view of what goes on. And the hope, belief, is that the rules of extensional type theory uh, from Pell's paper in 1979 can all be justified. And, you know, although, of course, this the ultimate idea is that this should be a pre-mathematical explanation. It's very good to do the mathematical work, which would kind of pin this down to the details. <laughs>